Massachusetts and the University of Virginia Decolonization. Uh, Dr. Brown held uh, several faculty positions at uh, Mount Allison University in Devices uh, and University of Virginia before joining McGill in 2011 as assistant professor and post-tenure among her many achievements, Dr. Brown is the manager and director of the Cell Imaging Mathematics Network and the Optical Imaging Facility. She's the founder and president of the Canadian Network for Technical Mathematics and of Mount University of Virginia, co chair of Bioimaging Mathematics. She runs the Montreal Applied Microscopy Company. Uh, Dr. Brown has an outstanding publication and funding record. And the research uh, specializes in uh, standards quality control and microscopy and light imaging, understanding of cell migration, particularly in And she's the leader in mentorship and education in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm. Uh... Happy to be here today and I'm going to do something a little bit different than what you're used to in a research seminar is this is going to be more about networks, technology, training, education, and the number of different national and international groups that I'm part of. And I hope to also convey um, where students and postdocs can also get involved if they want to um, travel to learn new technologies and get involved in these these different groups. So just as a background, the technology is really advancing um, at a really rapid pace. And I'm sure you all know in your research labs, we wanna try all the newest technologies and tools. And it's hard for an individual research lab to have the finances to buy these advanced systems. And it's also difficult to maintain a level of expertise in all the different technologies um, and use, be able to use them to their full potential. So scientific platforms, or they're also known as core facilities or shared research resource labs are a way to overcome this. So scientific platforms, um, first we can define. So they're shared centralized laboratories and they tend to work on an economy of scale where you can centralize these things and make it more affordable for everybody to have access. They tend to have specialized instruments or services. So sometimes they're, they're like tissue banks or, or cell banks and things like that. And then other times they're instrument um, rich, like uh, the facility, um, the advanced bioimaging facility. The main advantage is that they're um, run by dedicated experts um, or what we call platform scientists and in microscopy imaging scientists. And these uh, researchers tend to be multidisciplinary where they're they're interested in the technology, but they also know how to apply it in many different areas. They tend to be open to the community. So this really um, fits in with the equity uh, question that people are talking about a lot these days where everybody has access. So it doesn't matter whether your early career or your lab's been around for 30 years, it doesn't matter whether you have one small research grant or you're a million dollar a year lab, you have access to the latest technologies. And this is really important for early career researchers because they can get going um, by using the equipment and expertise as they're setting up their labs. And they tend to be discrete units or, or have discrete space and um, dedicated equipment. So they're not usually part of a research lab, but they're, they're usually separate. So one example, of course, is the Events Bioimaging Facility, which has been in operation here at McGill since 2005. And uh, these are just some of the instruments that we have. So we have uh, workhorse wide field microscopes for doing fluorescence imaging and bright field live imaging. We have uh, confocal laser scanning systems for doing high resolution and spectral imaging. We have um, some labs in the cancer center doing seven color uh, imaging with our spectral system. We recently acquired a lattice light sheet system, which is a high resolution system designed for high speed imaging. And it's the, the first one in Canada with uh, two cameras. I think the serial number is number three, which is a great thing. And then it's also still not quite working. so. We're uh, working with the company to get it up and running. So it should be available soon. Um, we also have a, a tender out right now for a Leica Stellaris 8 with uh, Dr. McKinney in pharmacology and Dr. Siegel in uh, the cancer center. And this is gonna be our first uh, dedicated super resolution system. We'll have up to about 50, 20 to 50 nanometer resolution. And it also has fluorescence lifetime imaging, which brings in a lot of biophysical applications it also has a really neat feature where you can just remove autofluorescence because autofluorescence has a different lifetime than 
than the fluorescence of your dyes. So for plant tissue or liver tissue, it's just highly autofluorescent. It's a, a really nice feature that we'll have as well. And then image analysis is a big part of what we do. More and more people want to quantify what they're measuring. And so we offer custom support um, to image, basically develop image analysis pipelines. And we offer support for Amara's commercial software, as well as the open source Fiji ImageJ. Just a couple more uh, numbers about the facility. So our, our motto is from planning to publishing. So we're really happy when students come to us at the start of their project. So we can also give them tips and advice on preparing samples. Um, we do about 200 one-on-one -on -one trainings a year. We have currently 230 unique users, 76 labs from 21 departments and institutions, and we serve four of the faculties across McGill. Um, we have three full-time dedicated image scientists and image analysis right now, and we're um, putting out about 30 publications per year from the users in the facility, and uh, about 13,000 hours of microscope use per year, 5,000 imaging sessions or 14 imaging sessions per day. So it's a busy spot. And uh, one of the things I really like about it is we're serving all different areas. So we have people coming from engineering and chemistry and physiology and biochemistry. And so it keeps it really interesting for the staff as well to be working on all these different uh, questions. So in order for us to stay cutting edge and be in the forefront, we need to interact with the national and international community. So I've been very active in informing and then uh, um, engaging with other communities around the world. So I want to spend the next while just telling you about some of the national and international networks and what they've been doing um, in the community. So there's four networks I'm going to talk about. The Canadian Network of Scientific Platforms is, is a network of, of all different technology platforms, so it's not just imaging. Uh, Canada Bioimaging is part of that network as a technology node. Bioimaging North America was formed after Canada Bioimaging, so Canada Bioimaging is part of Bioimaging North America. And then Global Bioimaging was kind of the premise uh, for me when I saw what they were doing of getting Canada involved. So when we first saw Global Bioimaging, um, they had a big map and they had an arrow going across the Atlantic that said USA. And so I reached out to them right away to see if we could get Canada on that uh, map. And then the last group I'll talk about is Corap Limi. And I always say they didn't ask me about the name, but <laughs> I like the short Corap Limi is kind of fun, but I, I won't go through the, the long name, but it's basically um, looking at standards and quality control for microscopy. So the Canadian Network of Scientific Platforms was really founded to bring together researchers in all different technology areas because we all have the same challenges. We're all struggling with sustainability, recruitment and retention of experts. And we're all in that interface where we're really a hub interacting between companies, between um, research, uh, researchers in the universities, training students, and um, we are overseeing scientific infrastructure. So we wanted to bring the community together to kind of brainstorm and see what are the challenges we're facing and how can we uh, improve the, the research ecosystem in Canada. So the group um, um, rate, oh, so this is a little bit of background. We, we right now have 194 platforms from across Canada. And since 2000, the CFI and, and partners have invested about $20 billion in research infrastructure. And our network represents about 1 billion of that. So we're, we still have work to do to build if we wanna really include everybody, but uh, we have a pretty good representation of, of the community. And as I mentioned earlier, it's covering all different areas of research from nanofabrication to flow cytometry, imaging, NMR. And um, like I said, the idea is to come together and try to find solutions to, to common challenges we all have. So because it started here in Quebec, so okay. myself and others uh, in microscopy and flow cytometry started the group, and then we expanded out to other technology areas. So. We're working on uh, trying to get more people involved, but it's a 100% volunteer organization. So um, one of our things is we've been trying to get funding, but it's, uh, it's challenging with these um, networks. Everybody sees the value of the network, but they don't kind of see where it fits in the funding ecosystem. So it's been a, a bit of a challenge there, but, but we have been working um, to try to gain a voice 
you know, we're because we're a big group and we're representing a lot of scientists, we've written recommendations for the NSERC 2030 strategic plan. We sent a recommendation to CFI for the 2023-2028 strategic plan. And um, we're really trying to engage the policymakers in that to, to try to get more investment in platforms and in networks so that we can really make sure that people know what technologies are out there and have access to them. So we have an annual platform scientist award program. We do professional development training and platform management training. So Canada Bioimaging is, is under the umbrella of the Canadian Network of Scientific Platforms. So we're a technology node and we're trying to build the network with other technology areas. We've also been working with the Canadian Helium Initiative. I don't know if some of you know about the helium crisis, but I guess helium is a byproduct of natural gas. And with the war in Russia, there's even more strain on that supply. And the prices have like gone up tenfold in the last couple of years. And this is used in every MRI and every NMR machine in the world. So, so they've gotten together and put a position paper together to the government to see if there can be ways to centralize helium um, in Canada and secure it and build in these um, recycling um, loops in the system that the helium evaporation is recovered. And, and we've been trying to help them just giving them a bigger voice by being part of our network. So there's lots of areas where where we can come together nationally and help. Um, Canada Bioimaging is also part of Bioimaging North America, as I mentioned, and uh, this includes Canada, Mexico, and the US. So for Canada, we have 86 members, 28 facilities, eight provinces, and 38 institutions and companies. And Canada Bioimaging has been aiming to try to just coordinate across the country our workshops, courses, job shadowing, best practices, and I'll talk more about this in terms of bioimaging North America, because we're trying not to duplicate um, what we're doing. So we're doing it under that umbrella and bioimaging North America has funding. So obviously they have full-time people working on it. So we're uh, collaborating with them. We've also been working on forming a national database of unique instruments and expertise so that people across Canada know what technologies are out there in microscopy and how to access them. So Bioimaging North America was founded in 2016 and got a grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, in 2020. And um, we have two full-time staff now working on the project as well as funding for mobility um, workshops and courses and just building community and building networks. So it's really focused on bringing the community together to share expertise. We've been also working on standards and quality control uh, professional development activities. So often the people working in scientific platforms don't, they're not faculty and they're not students. And so they often fall through the gaps as far as training for like soft skills, like time management and, and um, things like that. So we're trying to fill that gap and offer them opportunities. And they often don't have access to, for funding to cover the cost of professional development. And then we're really trying to build the connection with the other networks around the globe. So when we um, set up the group, we really wanna make sure that the network was meeting the, the needs of the community. So we spent a lot of time talking to the community of, of what, what could a network do that would help you with your day job. And so we have communications, which is really um, you know, just getting the word out. We have training and education so that people can share resources and expertise and not duplicate services. There's a group on diversity and inclusion that's doing a seminar series and a career series right now. Um, I'll tell you more about quality control and data management under the Core App Lemi group. Um, we're engaging with the corporate partners to understand what are their needs in the community and how can we work with them like to make sure that instruments are meeting our needs. And also um, they've done a pilot program where they took people from facilities and trained them on the microscope so that they can do basic service and not have to call in a service engineer. And uh, then imaging informatics is a really big area of development uh, for image analysis and, and data analytics. So I won't go through all of the activities going on, but um, there's a lot of things happening with meetings and, and exchange of experience. So I'll give you a few examples um, to just show you the, the power of these networks. So this is a project that I, I think is such a great example of what we can do if we all come together. 
So it's called Microscopy DB or Microscopy Database. And what Bina did is we, we had funding in the Chan Zuckerberg grant and our full-time staff went around to all the communities around the world who have websites with information about microscopy. So jobs, events, workshops, courses. And the Royal Microscopy Society was doing one thing and the European Light Microscopy Group another and Africa another. And our Canada Bioimaging website was kind of sitting out, out of date because we don't have somebody working on it on a regular basis. And they gained consensus from everybody in the community. You can see the, the partners we have so far. And there's a centralized database where all of this goes. So you just fill out a form. So if, if you have a job for a, you know, a research of, um, associate in your lab with microscopy experience, you would go to microscopy DB and post it, and it would go to all these websites. So it would go to Canada Bioimaging, it would go to Euro Bioimaging, it would be populated in all those places around the world. So the big thing was that we didn't want to say Euro Bioimaging, you know, come look at the Canada Bioimaging website, that's where all the information is. So this is in the background. So all those groups still have their own presence, they have their presence to their community, we're not drawing traffic away from their website, um, but they all have the up to date information. So for Canada Bioimaging, we now have a direct link to the Microscopy DB, and this automatically updates when new entries are made in the database. So I just, you know, looked at events, and these are the three top events that popped up. And um, you can sort, you can filter if you just want the Canadian events, you can just filter by Canada. And uh, our website will stay up to date and current based on that database. And then if you do have a job or an event, you only have to enter it one place, and then it, it gets disseminated. And similar to the Bina website, they have a bit more of a, of a higher level interface, but this is their job openings. And so you can go click on that and find all of the jobs that are in the database. And as I say, if somebody in Africa Bioimaging puts in a job, it's gonna populate here. So it's a really nice way that, to, you know, to reduce duplication, make sure people are aware of everything that's going on and really minimize the burden when you're, when you're trying to promote these things. So the other example I wanna give you is exchange of experience. So the value of these networks is to learn from each other and to find the right people who know about a technology say that you wanna learn about. So just over the last two weeks, we had Karen Jacobs here in Montreal. She came for our Montreal Light Microscopy course and then she stayed for a few days to visit our facility. She also went to visit the imaging facility with Thomas Stroh at the Neuro and with Alka Kusterschuk at uh, St. Justine. Um, she gave a seminar about the African Bioimaging Initiative, and uh, she participated in the, in the Montreal Light Microscopy course. Um, there's also an international um, expansion microscopy user group, and this was a really nice example um, for me personally. So Natalie Wu is a relatively new master's student in my lab, and we wanted to get into expansion microscopy. So this is a biological... Well, it's really a biochemical technique where you, instead of um, buying a super resolution microscope, you make your sample bigger. So if I want 10 times resolution, I can make my sample 10 times bigger and use a regular microscope and get 10 times the resolution. So it's very tricky. It's all polymer chemistry and cross-linking and, and so on, but it's uh, really been well established in the field, but it's, it takes some expertise. So Natalie and I uh, brainstormed and decided to form a, a user group and because of all my connections in the different networks, within about two weeks, we had 100 members from 23 countries in the group. And we're meeting online every two months. And we're talking about different topics, dyes, staining, reagents. And um, we're happy that uh, our April meeting, we've secured um, Ed Boyden, who is the creator of the technique at uh, MIT, is gonna be um, speaking at our, our user group meeting. And the thing that's been most impressive for me here is the people who've got it working, who are willing to come and share and talk to people and, and try to help them um, get things going in their lab. So to me, this was a really concrete example of, of how we can use these networks to do good science. And hopefully Natalie will get up and running doing that much faster than she would if she was just reading papers and trying things out in the lab. So this was a collaboration with the Royal Microscopy Society and also with uh, Bioimaging North America and Canada Bioimaging. And we're setting up a second group now on lattice light sheets since that's a new technology to Miguel. So I then wanted to move on to global bioimaging. So um, global bioimaging is kind of where this all started for me when I saw that they had this network. 
I wanted to make sure Canada was part of that. And uh, it's an international network of bioimaging facilities and communities. And this is the current map. Um, so there's communities really across the whole globe. And um, there's emerging partners in more countries now coming in Chile, Argentina, Africa, Armenia, and South Korea. And um, it's really similar to what Biomaging North America is doing because we basically copied what they were doing and, uh, and trying to build that international community. They also had funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, which has really been able to help them ramp up. It was originally um, funded with Horizon 2020 funding. And I'm going to show you a little quick video, which is understanding life imaging from a single cell to complex ecosystems. Imaging technologies are crucial. In Brazil, scientists use microscopes to study tropical diseases and evaluate the influence of climate change. Researchers in Israel employ underwater microscopes to observe life beneath the sea. Imaging technologies also help us understand the human body and improve diagnosis and treatment. To solve humanity's greatest challenges, imaging scientists and infrastructures must be connected. Global bioimaging is bringing together people, the communities in imaging. The inspirational stories of where people come from and that um, there's so much more than just a day-to-day -day life in a microscopic lab. There's, there's a world out there that we are making an impact in and we should see that bigger picture. So we're building the Latin America Bioimaging Network and Global Bioimaging has allowed us to have a stage to connect with the rest of the world. Uh, the impact is immense, I would say, because it was through the Global Bioimaging that I come into contact with a lot of absolutely fantastic and vibrant uh, imaging communities. Our mission is to promote and connect imaging scientists and imaging research infrastructures from around the globe. One way to be part of it is to join our working groups. So there are several and with different topics and anyone can join. It's together. Exchange. Cooperation. Connection. Community. Inspiring. So, um, that gives you kind of in, an, in a two minute video, a, an idea of what global bioimaging is. And they run an exchange of experience meeting every year, um, bringing together people from across the globe. So this last one was in uh, Uruguay uh, in September of 2022. And the next meeting was just announced for South Africa in um, October of 2023. So if anybody's interested, let me know. Um, but as it said in the video, the, the main, um, um, the main focus of this group is also working groups. And because it's such a large global community, they've also been working on international recommendations. So if we wanna change things and, and have things more centralized and focus on these scientific platforms and imaging platforms, we need to, to show people why, why is it important and what is the value? So um, one document um, that I was part of um, working on is on how to measure the impact of imaging facilities. And we went through different key performance indicators and socioeconomic indicators and how those can help you demonstrate the impact of a facility. There's also a group working on a career development recommendation so that institutions can see how um, careers could evolve for people working in these facilities um, in order to recruit and retrain the best scientists. And then there's, there's several other um, on training. I'll give you a few examples as well. This is another uh, document that was just published in 2022 um, ad, on the added value of open access imaging facilities. And this could really be translated into any, any type of technology platform. It doesn't have to be imaging. But the nice thing is they went through systematically the different stakeholders and what's the value for the researchers? What's the value for the staff in the facility? the manufacturers of the equipment, and then the national decision makers and funders. So these are just a few examples, but the document goes through in a fair bit of detail the, the advantages for all those different groups. And so one of the, the main things that these platforms and these international communities bring is, is the added value of training and education. So Global Bioimaging has uh, 
training for imaging core facility staff. So they do thematic events and organize and deliver training. And the idea here is that they're training the imaging scientists so they can go back to their institutions and train the graduate students and postdocs. There's also the international job shadowing program where people can um, travel through to different facilities. So that's what Karen Jacobs was here on last week. And then they also have an online training resource with lots of different information about different um, programs. So this was a course um, that I was part of just a couple of weeks ago in, in uh, Cuernavaca, Mexico, that was run by Global Bioimaging and one of the national imaging labs there. And there were 15 attendees from 15 countries. And the theme was core facility management, impact and research data management. And uh, it's amazing to learn from the different countries. You know, you see where people have the same challenges. You see where people have a system that's a little bit better. Um, we had one researcher running a facility in Qatar and they have tons of money for equipment, but there's not that many people using the facility. And so there's always, a, I think the, the people in um, South America are very surprised to, to hear that the, like that in Canada, we have challenges too. So I think it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see what's working. In Argentina, they have a national database of all the imaging infrastructure. Actually, it's all the infrastructure, research infrastructure. And if you put your equipment in there, they will give you funding for basic repairs. So any repair under fifty thousand dollars is is covered. You just have to write a, a short justification. And then the trade off is you have to make it available to anybody in the country, um, twenty percent of the time. And so this is a way to keep infrastructure running. Something I think CFI could really learn from. You know, as a good model for Canada. Um, so last week we had the Montreal Light Microscopy course. So this was run um, through the Advanced Bioimaging Facility, but under the umbrella of Canada Bioimaging and Bioimaging North America. And as I mentioned earlier, Karen Jacobs was here from South Africa as part of that course. And uh, we had 12 students, um, really diverse group from plant biology, neuroscience, cell biology, material science. We had two corporate participants who were from an optics company that wanted to understand the applications of their products. And then we had five companies involved in the, the training itself. And our plan now is, um, I'm gonna be working with Karen Jacobs and some people from Global Bioimaging and Bioimaging North America to run this again this summer in the last week of July. And what we're gonna do is bring the imaging scientists from around the world here to learn how to run the course. So they're not gonna take the course, we're gonna teach them how to teach the course. And then we're gonna give them all of our slides and our lab material and also, learn from them if they have other sort of exercises and activities they're doing in their communities, then those could be added to the, the repository. And the idea is to build up a, a database of materials so that people don't have to design an introductory microscopy course when they start working in a new facility that they can draw on the community and use those resources. So, um, one other thing that we can really do that improves things for the scientists is standards and quality control. So people are using microscopes more and more for quantitative um, research. And this is where the core Aplimi group comes in. So this group was founded during the pandemic and with a, um, a focus on standards and quality control. And again, all of the people in this community were kind of working on this on their own, but there was very little coordination. And during 2020, the group came together. It now has 462 members from 35 countries. And there's also, um, I don't know if you can see, it's a little blurry down there, but uh, we have a lot of, um, of industry people. So there's 118 people from industry and 17 people from standards organizations. So we have people from the German standards organization and ISO involved. And one of the really interesting projects that's come out of this is the camera companies are engaged with the group and we're now trying to get them to put more information in the image data about the camera so that you don't have to go digging in the you know, background to find out what's the sensitivity of my camera, what's the pixel size, and that that would all be more accessible to the user. And the hope is that eventually, you know, the microscope companies will also work with us on that. So it really is a diverse group of uh, academics, manufacturers, standard organizations, and other groups. And um, basically people using microscopes or, or manufacturing microscopes. And this group is also designed in working groups. Um, if you look at the topics, you'll see they're very granular. 
So there's one on lateral and axial resolution of your microscope, um, stage focus and, and stability. And the idea is that these groups are, are led by community members. They meet monthly and the, the goal is to generate protocols and procedures that would then become international standards that everybody would use. <coughs> so this is just one example. Um, if anybody's in protocol development, Protocols IO is a open, um, it's just, I'm sure if open source would be the right, open science, I think, uh, initiative where you can put protocols and you can work on them as a group before you make them public and people can comment on them. And so this is a, um, a couple that have been published by Corap on point spread functions. So measuring microscope resolution. And the second one is on illumination power and stability. So making sure that your light source is stable when you're doing quantitative microscopy. And then because the community was together and we were talking about a lot of different projects and things that were going on, we approached Nature Methods and they actually put out a special issue in December 2021 on reproducibility and reporting and microscopy. And so there's eight articles in there, including the, the article introducing the core app community to, to the broader community. And they've just recently uh, engaged us to come up with a checklist for microscopy for all of their journals in the Nature portfolio. So making sure that people have a checklist of things they need to, to report. So again, I don't think that would happen but it was just one group going to the journal saying you need to do more reporting. You know, it's because it's a community um, that we were able to, to work with them and, and improve reporting. So my last topic uh, comes from that is uh, research data management. So this is something uh, some of you may have heard about that uh, most of the funding agencies are now asking people to share their data and make it open and accessible. And it's a great idea, but you can't just take a USB key and give somebody your images, right? You have to tell them about your experiment and all the, all the background. So it has to be based on this FAIR principle. So it's uh, findable. So the, the data has to be findable by humans and computer software. And uh, I know even within an individual lab, sometimes it can be hard to find the data from a paper. It has to be accessible, so it can be secure, um, but it needs to be accessible to you know, anyone who needs to use it. It needs to be interoperable, so it needs to be in a format that you can open it in different software platforms so that, so that it's um, accessible for people to use. And it needs to be reusable, so there needs to be enough information that you can reuse it and, and uh, publish with it and, and make sense of it. So why is this important? Um, well, we need to organize the data so people can, can find it. It's going to give us quality and rigor. So if we really report on all of the information, um, then you have a good quality data set that, that pe other people can use. It should help with reproducibility because you have all of the information you need to re reproduce an experiment. And then it adds value by sharing the data. So rather than repeating all these experiments again, why don't we just look at what's already been done? So some of you may or may not be aware that the Canadian data management and sharing policy was recently published. And um, each institution has to come up with their own research data management strategy. And then each researcher has to have a data management plan. And this is being implemented on select grants right now, but will be generally applicable to all research grants from the tri-agency. And you have to share all digital research data, metadata and code. So it's not enforced yet, it's a recommendation, but uh, it's coming. And of course, there's no new funding. So you have to do this with your existing CIHR budget because it's just putting on a USB key and handing to your coworker, right? So this is again where I think these networks like the CNSP can go and say, look, you know, this is great, but we need resources, you know? So this is a cute little cartoon. I'm just showing that if we don't have organization, then uh, it's going to be hard to make things findable and accessible if they're lost in the swamp or uh, the uh, retired professor's drawer. There's a few of those there. And um, just a couple examples. So um, the pharmaceutical companies were looking at the, the impact of low quality data and lack of rigor in, in drug discovery. And in 2011, they showed that 18% of phase two clinical trials only 18% of phase two clinical trials are successful. And one major reason is the insufficiency of validity of targets. 
And so billions of research dollars are basically spent on all of these targets with only a few actually leading to, um, to phase three clinical trials. So it really does slow development. And a lot of this is just because they don't have the information they need to reproduce the experiments. This paper um, uh, came out in eLife um, looking at imaging in particular, and they looked at 240 articles that contained images. So they looked at 240 random articles and 185 of them contained images and only 17% passed the minimum requirement test. And that was very minimum, like the objective lens, the magnification, the numerical aperture. Um, and they basically found that the image methods text was only making up a very small percentage of the paper. And in most cases, the image processing and analysis wasn't described at all. And then this work um, in the brain imaging database actually showed the value of sharing. So this was an interna international initiative where they scaled uh, scientific studies and made data avail available and then um, looked at the outcome. And you can see on the, the graph there, the contributors are the, the white bars down at the bottom here. And then the non-contributors are people who use data in the database and published it but they didn't contribute to the data. And so over this you know, fairly short time of uh, six years, there was 50 countries and six continents, 81 per, um, went into peer reviewed journals and the data was published in all kinds of different fields. So this is just a few examples. So there is value in making the data available and allowing people from all different fields to use it. And often they're gonna use it in a way you would never have even thought about. So if we want to share our uh, microscopy data, we need to have what's called the metadata. And metadata is data describing other data. So for a microscopy experiment, you need, for most, um, most uh, scientific experiments, you'll need information about the sample. So the experimental and preparation information. You'll need image, inter, information about how the data was acquired and then information about how the data was analyzed. So for example, for your sample preparation, you need to know the organism. Um, you would want to have things like what day was the experiment done, who performed the experiment, what was the protocol, and then information about how the sample was prepared. From the image acquisition point of view, there's all kinds of aspects. You want to know about the hardware, um, so the microscope that was used, how the, set, the settings were set up, what exposure time did you use, what zoom, and then um, as an added value, if you know, know about the quality of these systems, so has it been quality managed, is the light source stable, is the camera linear, um, then you can give more value to that data. And then for image data analysis, you really want to know um, what software was used, what version, how many, uh, run, how many analysis were run, how many images, cells, etc. So there's a lot of information there about if somebody wanted to reproduce this, they would need to know all of this information. And the, the more data you have, the more reproduced your, your experiments can become, but of course it gets more and more cumbersome to collect. So this um, is one of the papers in the special issue on nature methods um, with Katerina Stramboy de Castilla, who's at um, UMass Medical School, who we've been working on with this. And they've created this tiered system where as you go deeper, you get more and more technical information, but then it makes it more reproducible. So the idea now is to really just promote people at tier one, let's at least get the microscope, the objective lens and so on, but also have the framework ready to go deeper if we can get the companies involved and, and tools to do this. So if we wanna do this, we need the tools. So it's nice to say we need all this information, but how do we collect it? So there's a software called Amuro, which is the Open Microscopy Environment, and it's a, an initiative out of um, Scotland, and it's really designed for all of the things I've been talking about. So it's not just a, a database, it's really um, um, cataloging the images, it's collecting metadata, you can do analysis on the platform, and you can keep all of your information attached to the image. So two of the features of this um, program are Amuro figure, if anybody is interested, this is a fascinating program. You can, you can go to your folder and say, this is my control folder. This is my treated folder. I want to do an overlay and it'll automatically generate the, the panels from random images in each folder. 
You can change your overlay colors. It'll put the text on automatically from your image names, um, scale bars. If you do um, a time-lapse series and you pick a few frames from the time-lapse, you can actually go into each frame in the figure and switch the frame and it'll update the time reported on the, on the image. And then when you're done, you get a, a web link for a PDF file that you can give to your collaborators, your reviewers of papers, reviewers of grants, and uh, it's all flagged. And you know, if you have several people in the lab working on it, you can see who, who made it red and green, and you can tell them, no, don't make it red and green, make it green and magenta, you know? And so you know everything that's happened to the data. And, uh, and it links right back to the raw data. So if you clicked on the image in the middle there, it would go back to the folder where that image is. And you could also look at all the other images from that experiment. Yeah, it's really, really amazing tool. The second one is a Amero Parade. Um, and this one, um, you can actually do the data analytics. So you can link to things like image J and um, start looking at quantitative analysis. And this is just an example where you have a couple of outliers here. And you can click on these outliers and go back to the raw data and see the regions of interest. And what happened here is that these several cells were all lumped together as one region of interest, which is why the area and the intensity are so high, um, because it was a, a error in the in the segmentation. So you can really explore the data back and forth between the images and the outputs. So we wanted to have a Miro in at the ABIF, and we wanted to have a Miro in Canada. So we started a project with Canada Bioimaging to set up a national Miro image data resource. And I know I'm getting close to the end of my time, so I might go through this a little quickly. Um, but we got funding from the Digital Research Alliance, which was formerly Compute Canada. And uh, Steve Ogg at the University of Alberta set up an instance of Amiro in the cloud on the Compute Canada resources. And uh, this was a collaboration with uh, Thomas Stroh and myself here at McGill and Pina Colarusa at University of Calgary. And right now we have 184 terabytes on the server and we need to apply for renewal in the fall. It's apparently the first Amiro based um, open database in the in the cloud. Um, so there's no other groups that have done that yet. Um, and then fortunately, um, with Thomas Stroh at the Neuro, we were able to get funding from the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute, which was matched by the Molson Foundation to continue this project. Um, so we get 200,000 over two years, and it really is really well aligned with open science, because this is a way to put your data and share your data, um, and it's being run under Canada Bioimaging. And then some of you may know Judith Lacoste, she used to work at the Advanced Bioimaging Facility and the Cell Image and Analysis Facility in Biology, and she has her own company, and she was really, uh, I think, visionary back in 2006, was wanting to do everything that I've been talking about. And uh, we hired her to manage the project of, of ramping up the Amiro and getting, getting people using it. So just one example, we're, we're right now piloting it. So if anybody has data they wanna share, whether it's published or unpublished, um, let me know, because we're looking for more case studies to sort of iron out all the, the bugs first. But this is a project with uh, Peter McPherson's lab at the Neuro called Y Kairos. And it's an antibody screening project and they're doing a really nice, uh, they have a really nice workflow where they're taking knockout cells and, and uh, regular cells and co-culturing them. So the purple cells here are knockout for the protein of interest and the green cells have the protein of interest. And then they're using DAPI to detect the cells. And there's a membrane marker I'm not showing here, which shows the knockout versus the non-knockout cells. And they're screening all kinds of antibodies. So this is an example of TEM106B. And you can see only one antibody has a good ratio of intensity relative to the knockout cells. And that, that's the one I just showed you in the previous slide. So they've now gone through 67 um, antibodies, antibody targets. Um, so they're doing about six antibodies for each one. And 50 report high quality antibodies. And they're looking at immunofluorescence, but also Western blot and co-IP. And um, they're publishing all of these on F1000 as data notes. So they're working with the pharmaceutical companies, the um, people manufacturing the antibodies, and they, they donate the antibodies in exchange for the reports. And so the plan is to put all these images on the Amero database so that people can also go back and look at the raw data if they want to buy a certain antibody. 
Um, so the last um, part is how do we get our images in the database with the metadata? So we need all that information about the experiment and the and the microscope and the analysis, and that's not readily available. So this has been a project with Katerina Stramboy de Castilla's lab, working with us to develop the tools that we need. So the first thing they've done is an automated batch import tool where you can enter all of your experimental data. So right now it's an Excel based drop down menu. So you can go in and pick your cell line and your fluorescent probes and so on. But the hope is to make this into a, a you know, some kind of a graphical interface. And then um, all of that data gets associated with your images. And when you upload to Miro, all of that information will be tagged within each image. The other piece is the instrument itself. So Katerina's lab has developed a tool called MicroMeta app, um, where you can go in and enter all of the components of your microscope right down to the serial number. And you get a unique identifier for each component and a unique identifier for the microscope. And she's also working on trying to put this into a database so that if you had a similar microscope to someone else, you could at least start with that and just update some of the components. So one of the things that, that came up during this time that we realized made things difficult was um, there's not a standard ontology for these things. So for example, for Alexa Flora 4488, there's four ways you could write it. And a database is not going to find all of those the same. So, so this is something that they've kind of stepped back a little bit to go backwards and make sure that we come up with a common language and go back to these international communities to make sure we agree upon the terms. Not a small feat, but <laughs> something that needs to be done. And then Joel Ryan from our facility developed a, he built on a tool that was um, developed in the States uh, called Methods J2, um, which automatically generates the methods text. So you can open your image, open the microscope JSON file from Micrometa app, and then it will automatically generate a draft tax, text, sorry, for your um, materials and methods section of your paper. So methods J2, so like DAPI was excited with the Excite 120 LED and so on. So this is um, available and operating now on, on uh, we have a GitHub page with all the information and uh, there's step-by-step -step workflow of how to, to do that. And we have two of our microscopes in the facility so far with the, all of the information in the JSON file. And then sort of showing how we go back to the, the networks, we worked with, um, Global Bioimaging, and they've put all of this into a, an online independent training module where you can go and learn about all of this in more detail and find all the tools. So we're running a, a Miro workshop um, the week after our Train the Trainer course for two days um, to train people on a Miro figure and a Miro parade and, and hopefully have um, support for how to upload your images to the Canadian resource. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, we'll have registration soon. And then I um, put together this slide, which has a few people I didn't talk about, but I think just shows you how uh, the title of my talk about international collaboration for quality science, that if we work together, training and education standards, sharing our expertise with one another, um, we can really build a community to to do good quality bioimaging. And then these are the people I mentioned most along the way um, working on the Amiro uh, National Database. And that's what I have. So thank you for your time. So the Advanced Bioimaging Facility has a 200 terabyte server at the at MedIT in this building, um, but it's not really meant for long-term storage because we don't have enough room for everybody. So um, we're still doing the same as a lot of people of backing things up on portable hard drives and, and having things on the server as well, but it's, it's not long-term. We had tried to um, back things up as a redundancy with the, Canada, the Digital Research Alliance. But um, the connections between McGill and the Alliance are quite slow. So even a fairly small data set could take you know, a week or more to upload. 
So um, I don't have a good answer. Um, I think what we would like to see is that this Canada bioimaging instance, for, for example, could become a long-term storage for, for our whole facility and hopefully for people across Canada. And rather than each institution now trying to scramble and share data, that we would come up with these national solutions. Um, but right now we have to reapply for that space every three years. So it's hard to tell people it's, you know, you can put it there and it's, it's going to be secure when, when we have to reapply every three years. So we're, we're meeting with them next week, actually, to talk to them a bit more about this project and see what they can offer. Because it's hard to get people to spend the time, you know, of uploading all of this and doing all this work if, if it's for three years. Yeah. Um, I was just going to try. A... <laughs> so, so McGill, I, I think it came out yesterday. There's an email. There's an event next week on the 13th. Um, so they're doing it through the librarians, which I think is smart. Um, librarians have been archiving information for hundreds of years, but I think they're not used to the size and magnitude of what we're looking at. So we've been trying to communicate with them just to let them know, like, we know you can help, but do you appreciate this? And so I don't think the, I think this Amiro instance would make more sense than the library to, to archive image data, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So they talked to the library. So you're the interesting stuff through including some new stuff that's back in my talk to you last mm -hmm. I just wonder how could it be continued to also be dovetail with innovation? Like innovation in my process. So there are some facilities around the world. Um, Peter O'Toole at York University actually runs two facilities. He has a development facility and a, and a application facility. And they develop the technologies and then ramp them into the service core when it's ready. You know, So they'll have power users kind of testing things. And then when it's ready, they'll bring it into the service core. I think that's a fantastic model. Um, but I think the, the main thing that's missing is the people. And um, even in our facility, we have three, three full-time people, but we have almost 300 users. So that's one staff for every 300 users or for every hundred users. And I really think for these advanced tools, you need a dedicated full-time person because they need to be on that microscope doing lattice light sheet every day in order to really become, you know how when you're in your postdoc or your grad school and you, you know the instrument so well, you're like, there's something off today. I don't know what it is, you know? And you need to be on it. I'd say at least 50% time. So that's something we've been trying to, to find creative ways to find funding, um, either through the companies or through grants. Um, but I think we could definitely be doing more. Yeah, so Oxford is another interesting, um, they have another interesting model too, where they have a team of engineers. So they have four engineers who are, um, basically hired out across the campus to do optics stuff for people. So if you wanted to build a system or you had a built system in the postdoc left, they could come in and fine tune it and get it up and running again. And, and you pay them for their hours, but they're part of a core team at the university that's, you know, so their salaries are paid somehow. I don't know whether it's through the institution or through grants. And then you could just hire them out for what you need. So that would be another really interesting model um, to have those experts around. And it can't be one person, right? Because different people are gonna have different skill sets and, and they need a team to work themselves with to have a good research environment and yeah. But there's lots of potential there for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a really good point. Um, so in the Amero database, it gives you that PDF link. So it is ready that if you wanted to put your figure in your paper with Amero, you'd have the PDF link that would link right back to the database. So I think what's missing is the requirement from the journals. 
Um, but I think now that the funding agencies are pushing, so NIH is, also has a similar mandate now that all data has to be shared. I think you're gonna see that change over the next few years. But I think the key is that we work together and we don't have a patchwork of solutions where you know, for this journal, I have to publish my data here. And, and then it's not trivial that these databases, like they're gonna be you know, petabytes of information, not, not uh, terabytes. So, so we also have to think about the resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some of the other fields are, are ahead of imaging for sure. So it's good to learn from what's been done. I can't seem to get out of Zoom. I don't know if there's any questions on Zoom. I'll, I'll ask a question. Can you hear me, Claire? Yes. Okay. So uh, 